Hey everyone, I'm Kevin Wallace, pastor of Redemption to the Nations Church. Listen, I'm grateful that you have joined us today for this message that God has given me to speak to your heart and to your life. I believe it's going to bring you strength and hope. I want you to pay attention. I want you to stay with me till the end. I'm gonna come back and pray with you. Enjoy this message today. Tell Asher good morning. Four months old. I, I just want to take a few moments today and I want to go to Romans chapter 8 and I want to talk uh, about, about kingdom responsibility. And I want to preach a message today called Roll Call. Look at somebody tell them Roll Call. How many remember Roll Call growing up in school? Uh, they probably do it some way different now. They, don't, they may not even check attendance anymore. But I remember growing up in school, we had Miss Brown, who she would yell every child's name, and we had to say, here! This is a time where we need citizens of the kingdom to be present, to be available. And I want to talk about that today for just a moment. I want to go to Roman. This is a different kind of text for this, but I, I have preached in the past. If you've only been here for a little while, we not preached it so much lately, but there was a season where for about a year and a half, all I preached was the kingdom and the message of the kingdom. I feel God leading me back into some of that because I think in this day and hour that we live, there are so many kingdoms of this world that are trying to surface and are vying for your attention and for mine. We need to be reminded that our citizenship is first and foremost in the kingdom of God. And many times churches have not preached the kingdom. We have just preached church. And so people get fed up with church. And I understand why. But if you ever get a revelation of the kingdom, you'll never get fed up with the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is not a bunch of religion. The king kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. How many could stand some more righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost? So today I want to talk about, I want to talk about, uh, just being available, being present, and I want to preach this message called Roll Call. Romans 8, 12, when you got it, say amen. amen. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Watch the verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Say, these are the sons of God. Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Say, that we are, come on, children of God. And if we're children, then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, we will also reign with him or be glorified together. Verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Watch verse 19, for the earnest expectation of creation, say creation, creation. eagerly, eagerly, awaits, cries out, longs for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption in the glorious, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. And you can put your finger on Luke chapter 7 because I'm going to use that a little bit this morning as well. But I want to talk about that, that thing Paul was getting at here in Romans chapter 8. He tells us what it looks like to be a child of God, reminds us that we are children of God, and then he tells us that the whole world is trying to find the children of God. Help me today, God. I need you, Lord. 
And the people of God need you to receive the word of the Lord today. May a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus and the truth of your word, may it rest upon us today. May the word of God find entrance into, thy, into our heart because at the entrance of thy word there is life. And so today we pray, God, that we would have a moment of focus. May you have our undivided attention. May you speak to us what is on your heart over these lips of clay. Be glorified now, Lord. I give you my ears to speak to and my mouth to speak through. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said amen. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. So I've taught a number of times in this house on the tension of the kingdom of God. And there is a tension in the kingdom of God that is presented to us in the Bible itself. It's a theological tension that seems to be um, two different sides of the same coin. And the kingdom of God is one of these subjects where we find tension in the word. And by tension, here's what I mean. There are places in the scripture that say the kingdom of God is coming, and there are places in the scripture that say the kingdom of God is already here. Some places say the kingdom of God is going to come, and we're going to see glorification, and we're going to see total redemption, and then there are other places where Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. So we have in this discussion of kingdom conversation the reality that the kingdom of God is already here and yet it's more coming. Say already. already. Say not yet. Already. Say already. already. Not yet. So there is a tension in the kingdom. It's not bad, it's just which one is it? Well, it's both. The kingdom of God is already here and the kingdom of God is coming. And if you don't believe in both of those things, then you live without power in the now and you can also live without hope for tomorrow. I believe in the coming of the Lord. I believe that any eschatology and study of end time things or teaching on end time things that does not include the literal bodily return of Jesus is not in harmony with scripture. I, I know that there are arguments over when he's coming. Some are pre-tribulation, some are mid-tribulation, some are post-tribulation, some are pan-tribulation. It'll all pan out. <laughs> the reality of it is, I believe Jesus is coming back to this earth. I believe he's gonna put his feet down on the Mount of Olives. I believe he's literally going to return to this planet and when he does, he's going to reverse the curse of everything that Adam's sin introduced and for 1,000 literal years, we're gonna rule and reign with Jesus and he's gonna look at you and I, those of us who were faithful, he's gonna say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a little, I'm gonna make your ruler over much. And every time I quote that and read that in the Bible, I get the image of a hillbilly pastor out in the middle of nowhere overseeing 50 people so well and nobody knows his name and one day he's gonna be ruling and reigning over nations with the Lord. I just, I just think that's fascinating. So Jesus is coming back. And you need to know that because we have an evangelistic responsibility to win souls. But I want you to understand that Jesus is coming back for a particular group of people. It's the church. But it's not the church in just any old condition. There are prerequisites given to us in the Bible that shape the kind of understanding we have about the kind of church Jesus is returning for. Some people believe that the clock that determines the return of the Lord can be found as it relates to Israel and the book of Revelation. I wanna tell you right now that Ephesians chapter four is a pretty good earmark and understanding of the kind of thing Jesus is looking for in his church. It says that he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the edifying and the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the fullness of the stature of the person of Christ. There is this development going on in the church where you and I are supposed to be coming more and more like Jesus. 
So we're, if you're not careful, you will be more focused on going up than you are growing up. I want to make, I want to submit something to you. Jesus is not coming back after immature, an immature bride. He's not coming back after a confused, chaotic bride shacked up in the back seat with the world who wants to date him on Sunday but act like they don't know his word, his ways, his heart. Monday through Saturday. He is not coming back after that kind of bride. And we need to focus more about the development and the maturity of the people of God than we simply do looking at prophetic charts on a board and telling everybody when the Lord's returning. The Lord is returning when the bride gets ready for his, her groom. I loosed a whole lot of people right there. But, but, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is that there is a stature we are to attain. There is a place we are to move toward. There, there is a development process in the people of God. And this is why we, we need to preach more about our identity in Christ so that we stop looking at other people as the plumb line by which we measure our lives and we start looking at the word of God as the measuring stick so that when we don't live up to this, we fall on our knees and beg for the grace of God who empowers us to overcome our sin so that we become who we could never become in our own strength. Look at somebody and tell them, let's grow up. So the Bible says in the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, and I read to you one of the most powerful chapters in the entire Bible, and I read a whole mouthful, but, but let me start from the, end, from the end and work my way back. The Bible says in Romans chapter eight, the whole earth is groaning for a manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. Now, I want you to hear me very clearly. I believe this text is indeed talking about final redemption and ultimate glorification in the end after Jesus returns. So everybody understand, I do believe this has eschatological implication, meaning that, that there will be a day when we will look upon him and though we see in part now, one day we will see in the whole. I do believe that's what Paul is talking about. When this corruption will put on incorruption, this mortal will put on immortality, death will be swallowed up in victory, we'll spend eternity with the Lord and be glorified we shall see him and we shall be like him I do know that's what Paul's talking about but I want you to pay careful attention to what Paul says Paul says in the eighth chapter of Romans the earth is groaning for the sons and daughters of God and I say daughters, and you say that's not in the text. It's implied in the text because it's not just that God is looking for men. He's looking for humanity that have been redeemed in the sight of God. Sons and daughters of God, hear me. The earth is groaning for you and I to be manifest. And you say, well, one day we're going to be sons and daughters of God. And one day in the future, a million miles away, we're going to manifest and the earth and creation are going to see it. I, I believe that. But if you believe we have to wait or should wait until we get there before the earth and creation sees a manifestation of God, you miss the entire point of the text in Romans 8. He is saying that right now, even up until the moment Paul wrote the text, he says the earth is groaning for a manifestation of the sons of God. But he just told them, you are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, put that up on the screen, chat. I want these people to see I'm not a heretic. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are already the sons and daughters of God. So in one hand, he says the earth is groaning, but he just told them, you are what they're groaning for. 
I'm not talking about the you that's unredeemed and full of pride and full of arrogance and you think you've got this. I'm talking about the you that's redeemed by the blood that contains the treasure in the earthen vessel. That the excellency may not be of us, but the excellency may be of him. Come on, somebody. I don't have anything on my best day. I don't have anything to change anything wrong in this world. But on my best day, I will, on my worst day in Christ, there is a redeemed spirit on the inside of me through which God manifests his life in my generation. And literally, we become living epistles by which men read us, our life, and the Christ in us. And we become hope to hope. Hopeless people, we become light to people in darkness. Not I, but Christ who. Paul says the whole earth is not groaning for a political movement. The whole earth is not groaning for a gender movement. The whole earth is groaning for sons and daughters who bear the image of Yahweh to rise up in their day and to demonstrate the life of God. And if you prescribe to the notion or idea that we're gonna wait until we get to heaven, until we're the sons of God, you miss the entire blessing of the new covenant. So here's what I wrote. Creation is crying out for who we already are and who we will gloriously become. Rewind. Creation is crying out for us to become aware of who we are and who we are going to gloriously become. Ready for this? How many have asked Christ into your life and trusted him as Lord? Lift your hand. Okay, you ready for this? According to John chapter three, when you ask Christ to be Lord of your life, repented and asked him to cleanse you of your sins, you did more than join a church. You got citizenship. Do you know how hard people fight for citizenship in America? I mean, come on, family. They're so desperate for the kind of life that you and I have the blessing and privilege of living that they, 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 under the threat of the elements and under the threat of punishment, under the threat of rivers and under the threat of famine, they walk miles and miles to get here to come into our country and to live. They fight for years to be citizens of our country. Can I tell you that when you got born again, Jesus took the fight out of it for you? You. Jesus crossed the river for you. Jesus paid the price for you and I so that we who lived in a land called darkness could be translated from a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And he dispelled the darkness and brought us into a place of light. You are more than a church member. You are more than a church member. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And you are right now presently and actively a son and a daughter of God. And in the future, that will come into all of its fullness. But I am thankful that God does not wait on us to get to heaven before he calls us his children. Amen. Which is why I say we, we are and we will be. I already am who I am becoming. While I'm in development, he still put me in the family. And I fear today that there are many people
people who think one day when I get to heaven, I'll stand in redemption and I'll have what I've waited. You will have the fullness of it, but I want to tell you right now, you can have a piece of it that lets you know you're going to have the fullness of it while you're in the process of getting there. Let me take you to Hebrews real quick. Let me show you something. Hebrews chapter 6. Is it okay if I just teach today? Uh huh. Let me just teach for a moment. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. I didn't plan on using this scripture, but it just came to me. So watch this. Um, for it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, verse 4, and become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Watch verse 5. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers from the age to come. You got to catch this. God lets you and I live on planet earth and taste the power of the age that is to come. How many are thankful for the promise that one day we're going to be in heaven and experience? Come on. Everybody will be happy. How many, how many know one day we're going to be happy over there? Well, can I give you a revelation? The writer of Hebrews said that whatever you think you're going to get to experience in the age to come, the Holy Ghost is so good that he'll take a piece of the pie from the age to come and he'll put it on a table and share it with you in the presence of your enemy. I don't have to wait till I get to heaven to know that heaven is good I, I don't know who I came to talk to today but I need to thank God that he's allowed us to taste heaven while we're on our way there look at somebody say neighbor it's already good Oh, yes, it's already good. I don't have to wonder about heaven. I, fe I felt too much glory. I've shed too many sweet tears. I've laughed in the Holy Ghost and spoken in too many tongues. I've seen too many answered prayers to wonder about our future. I know that the future is going to be glorious because he's allowed me to taste it in the here but now. Has anybody tasted the goodness of the world to come in the now? We are right now the children of God. And yet we will be glorified. And here's how I, I like to teach this. How many music people do I have in the room? You like music? Any music teachers? Anybody that knows how to read music? Lift your hand. Okay, how many know what a crescendo is? Yeah. Julian, can you show them what a crescendo is? It starts from... Yes. So, to, to do good, because just real slow, real slow, real slow. It's real slow. Ready? Follow me, Julian. Julian, where you at? <laughs> Watch, watch, watch. One more time, one more time, one more time. I call that in this teaching the kingdom crescendo. It starts out small, but the revelation of it continues to grow until one day. Here's what I believe. I believe the return of the Lord will happen as a crescendo of the kingdom message is preached and released on the planet. How do I know that? Because this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. God, I feel like preaching today. Some of you have got to understand, there is, there is something called a seed and God is willing to plant the kingdom as a seed because he trusts the power of the seed of the kingdom to crescendo and grow into a tree in which the birds of the air build nests in its branches. God, I feel like preaching today. You and I have got to understand, we are living in a moment where the message of the kingdom, I 
didn't say the message of politics or the church or, 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 or even religious politics. That's not the message Jesus died to give us. The message Jesus died to give was a message of good news for lost humanity. And when we begin to preach the message of the kingdom, it will crescendo into what I believe will be the coming of the Lord. That's why Jesus didn't come in the dark ages. Because there was no preaching of the kingdom. Y'all better hear me. There was no teaching of the kingdom. Oh, Jesus can do whatever he wants to do. He can, but he bound himself to his word. He said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in, I said the gospel of the kingdom. Well, I believe in the gospel. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Don't miss it. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. The apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom. What did John the Baptist preach when he came? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you know that when Jesus rose from the dead, according to Acts chapter 1, the resurrected Jesus made himself known by many infallible proofs. And what did he preach while he was on earth for 40 days? He preached the good news of the kingdom of God. Why? Because this earth is under a curse and a spell. It's living in darkness and there is no kingdom on this planet that will give you life. That's why Jesus came from heaven to earth. He brought the kingdom with him. That's why we call him the king. He's the king of his kingdom. And he, where is my help in this holy church? He did not come to build a denomination. Oh my God, I'm about to make a bunch of enemies. He did not come to build a denomination. He came to build his kingdom. He gave his blood for his kingdom. That's why we gotta stop talking about all this man-made stuff and tell people from every walk of life, every nationality, every color and culture, it don't matter where you came from, it don't matter what you've done, do you wanna be a part of the kingdom of God? Four minutes, Jesus. Go to Luke 7. Y'all think I'm serious. I'm just kidding. I don't care what time it is. Luke 7, 25. What did you come to see? Talking about John the Baptist. What did you come to see? A man clothed in soft garments, gorgeously appareled, living in luxury in the king's court. But what did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. For I say unto you, listen to this scripture, this is bananas. This is how I know we don't know who we are in the kingdom of God sometimes. For I say unto you, among those born of women, that there was no greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he or she who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor can't touch this. He or she who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. John who preached in a wilderness and people left the city to hear him preach. John who saw the dove descend on the Lord and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John who preached repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John who was a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make the crooked places straight and the high places low and lift up the... That man who was the prophet of all prophets and the Bible says you who are least in the kingdom are greater than John. How so? Because when you come into the kingdom you find access to what John looked into but never lived in. 
I feel some bells ringing and some stuff turning in your head right now. Somebody is waking up out of a religious coma. I said a religious coma. You have been on life support. You've been coming to church. You look alive on your face, but inside there is no response, no activity. There's no spirit activity happening in your life. And today I believe somebody's coming out of a coma of religion and you're coming into a revelation of what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of your God. The Bible says that the greatest, the pardon me, the least among those in the kingdom are greater than John. And this is interesting because the word least is the Greek word micros, where we get the word micro. Microscopic. The one in the kingdom who is I, I have to think it's probably me. Whoever the least in the kingdom is, I want to think it's me. That, that even the least in the kingdom that's microscopic and cannot be seen is greater. Do you know what the word greater? Don't, I'm, I'm drawing a parallel and a comparison. I want you to connect the dots here and I'm going to be done in a minute. But the least, the micros in the kingdom is greater, which comes from the Greek word megas. Micro meaning I got to get a microscope to find you, is actually mega. Anybody like mega? Come on, fry people from McDonald's. How many like mega? Come on, how many know there is no blessing in a regular size fry? But how many know there is a jubilee praise for a mega size? Come on, somebody. Come on in here. I read an article last week that said there are 13 ingredients in one McDonald's fry. I don't know what the 13 ingredients are, but all 13 of them sets me free and blesses, come on, it blesses your life. How many thank God for some fry? Here's my point, I'm kidding, I don't like fries, but here's the bottom line. The bottom line is this. In the kingdom, you, you try to become micros, and the more you decrease, John, the more he increased. Ah, I don't have time to, I'm trying to help somebody understand that the way the kingdom works is if you become micro, he'll make you mega. Oh God, who am I preaching to right here? God is trying, I didn't say become mega. I said become micros in the kingdom. And if you become micro in the kingdom, God will make you a mega version of who you were ever going to be. The greatest identity you can ever come in to is understanding that you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And as you decrease, he will increase. He, do you know there are different versions of you? How many are thankful that God allows new downloads and updates? Y'all are not going to help nobody in here. How, how many got an Apple phone? How many get excited a little bit every now and then when you get a, 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 a notification? And tonight at midnight, you are going to get an update. Uh-huh. And the first thing you do, if you geek out like I do, the first thing you do is you look at the update to see what is going to happen in this new update. What, ready? What kind of new features? Oh, yo, that's sweet. I can't wait for midnight to get my update because when I get my update, I can group pictures together and I can do FaceTime. How many thankful for the time that the upgrade and the update included FaceTime? Remember that seven years ago before we could FaceTime? And we were wondering what our kids looked like when we were going on a trip. But then at night, every night, if I go away somewhere to preach, I just FaceTime and Genesis is sitting there going, da 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 Why? Because I updated my phone. Hear me, can I tell you what I feel in my spirit right now for the people of God in this hour? I feel like a notification coming to your phone to tell you, child of God, there's about to be an update in your life and the, and the old version of you ain't going to cut it because God is about to, oh God, I better quit it. The earth is looking for an update. The earth is groaning for a people who have been updated. Wow. 
Well, why in the world did he up there with some Jordans on? You know, last week I wore a suit and you didn't say nothing about that, but you worried about me wearing Jordans. Every now and then I just let myself get updated and I just, I just have to express myself with some Jordan shoes. Don't get mad at me, it's an update. Every now and then we have to, oh, come on in here somebody. I'm telling you right now in the name of Jesus, God is about to give the church the ability to speak the language of this culture and the language of the culture is the language of the kingdom we will never reach this generation we will never listen we will never reach this generation trying to speak the language that the previous generation had to speak y'all don't like some of y'all don't like this I don't like change well the Lord didn't ask you This is not our church. Y'all, some of y'all got sideways when I said I wear my Jordans. You know why I do that? To drive you religious people crazy. <laughs> to keep y'all right. Because it's not my suit and tie that give me my oil. It's not my suit and tie that give me my anointing. It's not a suit and tie that give me power to break through. It's the Holy Ghost. And some of y'all gonna have to lose your religion. Oh God, I better quit. Cause now I'm getting ready to say something. When God got ready to raise up John, he didn't put him in the robe of a priest. He put him in locusts and, and he was eating locusts and honey and wearing camel hair. I'm telling you, there's a new generation of updated sons and daughters rising. Slap somebody, tell them update. I'm getting ready to close. Because I see some of y'all getting nervous. And here's what I want to tell you. That doesn't mean we don't sing old songs. But I don't sing those songs to make old people who like old songs happy. I sing old songs because old songs got oil on them. And I sing new songs because new songs got oil on them. And so don't come in here trying to cram the kingdom into your favorite way. Come in here and say, God, what do you want to update in me? What do you need to do in my life so that I don't miss my assignment as your son or daughter on the earth? This is why, stand with me, I'm through. I'm gonna finish this next Sunday because I feel a slight, there's a slight difference between a hostage crisis and a pastor in the middle of a hot message. And I, I could preach right now, my head is on fire right now. I tell, and we're coming back at six o'clock. I might just finish this one tonight at six o'clock. I'm just telling you that the old version of you, child of God, is not the version that you need to get uh, comfortable with because God is about, oh God, I feel this thing. God is about to stretch you. God is about to expand you. God is about to rip religious lids off of your life. You will not die in the wilderness. You were meant for the promised land. Somebody shout yes! And we got to break out. This house has got to break out of some previous versions of us so that we can step into the updated version because the earth is groaning for a manifestation of sons and daughters who know who they are and they know they're a son. When God got ready to change Babylon, do you know how he did it? He put three Hebrews, four Hebrews there, namely Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Don't miss this. It says that those four Hebrew boys were 10 times greater Here are four sons of God in Babylonian culture and they exceeded 
10 times greater than anybody else in Babylon. Well, let me just read it because I don't know why I'm in a rush. I'm the pastor. If y'all got to go somewhere, y'all just make yourself right at home. Stay standing, though. Don't sit. Matthew 13. Kingdom of heaven. Say the kingdom. Kingdom of heaven is like a man who planted seed in a field. The man slept. The enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And he ran away. The Bible said while the man slept, the enemy came and sowed tares. And then the blade of the wheat sprung up and brought forth fruit. But beside it, tares showed up also. And immediately, the man said, the servant of the man come to him and says, Sir, did you not sow good seed into the field? Where did the tares come from? And the owner of the field said, an enemy hath done this. And the servant said, I'm, don't miss what I'm teaching you right here. The, the servant said, I'm going to go jerk those tares up out of that field. And the owner said, no, you're not. Let them grow. I'm getting ready to set somebody free. Quit trying to get rid of all the tares in America. We need to get rid of them all. Kill them all, Lord. That sounds a whole lot like Jesus. You are too tear focused. I came to tell you that the wheat will never be hindered in its growth by the presence of tares. Let me say it like this. God don't have to get rid of the tares so you can grow. Okay, let's go a little deeper. God don't have to get rid of all the people that don't look like you, vote like you, sound like you, talk like you. He don't have to get rid of all them for you to become everything you're called to be. And anybody who won't be weak simply because you're surrounded by tares. This is where we are in the kingdom. We are, I see far too much complaining about the tares. I'm more concerned about people who call themselves weak. In one week, Pastor Richie, in one week, I got maligned for celebrating Juneteenth and maligned for celebrating the overturning of Roe versus Wade in one week. I got hate from both sides in one week, and you'll be blow your mind, all of it came from people in the so-called church. And I'm making some of you mad right now. If you're going to be a member of this church, you better know how we roll. We celebrate every culture. We honor every person, every, every race. And we honor, we honor babies in the womb. And we always will. Well, that ain't the kind of church I was raised. That's why I'm telling you, you better update. You better get your mind changed. You better stop acting hateful because Jesus is coming. And I know he ain't going to let the whoremonger and the drug addict and the pole stripper. I know they're not getting in. And neither are the hateful, malicious, racist. They're not getting in either. So you say amen or owe me, I don't care. Better get that heart right. You better start loving people from the womb to the tomb. Tell you right now, this house, this house and Athens and Cleveland cannot hold the harvest God has intended for it if we will just be the people of God and demonstrate the kingdom of our Lord. Throw those hands up all over this house. Father, I honor you. And I thank you for your presence in this room today. I thank you for the glory that came in in worship. And I thank you for the anointing that's been here while we're preaching. And I pray today you'll break some yokes and update some saints 
and let the newest version, the freshest version of them that they've ever known, let it come to be in their life. Don't let us stay stuck in wildernesses. Don't let us stay stuck in wildernesses when we've been destined for promised lands. Don't let our mind become our enemy by thinking that we've seen it all, heard it all, know it all, we've done it all, and we can't be trained, taught, or updated to become something greater than we've already been. Lord, take us where only your Holy Spirit can take us. If those hands all over this room, I want, I want the Holy Ghost to make a deposit. Oh God, we need a fresh update today. We need a fresh update. The roll call is happening. Where are the kingdom citizens? Where are the kingdom citizens? That's what he's saying. Where, where, do I have any sons and daughters present that have stri- strategic solutions for the problems going on in their generation? May this house not contribute to the demise and the moral dilemma of a nation. May God birth in you, people of God, strategies that will shift generations. You call Shehe I feel the Holy Ghost on me right now. If you're in this room, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me do two things. Let me give everybody in this room an opportunity to join the kingdom of God. This is not a religion. It's not even a church membership moment. This is, this is, and I don't mean to say that church membership is not important. It's just not salvation. If you're in this room and you say, Bishop, pray for me. I need to give Christ my life. I want, I want my heart to come open to the kingdom. And I want to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Would you pray for me, Pastor? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If if you want to give Christ your life and you want to make him Lord of all, I don't care how screwed up you feel on the inside. In this house and right now, Athens, in that location right now, in this house and in that house, the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over and he's touching lives. And if you need Jesus to become Lord of your life, I want you to throw your hand up when I say three. And I want you to say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I want to enter the kingdom of God. I feel it fixing to happen for somebody. You're coming out of darkness into his marvelous light. Coming out of death into life. Leaving the kingdom of hell and coming into the kingdom of heaven. I'm counting to three for you. If you want to give your life to Jesus, throw that hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray with me today. One, two, three, bam. Lift that hand up. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you, sir. I see that hand. God bless you, ma'am. At Athens, you can lift your hand as well. If you want to give your life to Christ, just throw that hand up. You can put your hands down. Everybody in this place, because this is a house of love, we don't want nobody to feel shame. I don't want anyone to feel put out and un unhopeful I want everybody in this room to know they're not alone and that they came into the right place if they needed Jesus to save them so look at your neighbor and say neighbor do you need someone to go to the altar and pray with you and if you come on everybody in this house all over this room if you lifted your hand or you should have if you need Jesus to save you come out of your seat right now and come stand in this altar pastor I don't want to leave like I came I saw some hands God bless you sweetheart for coming God bless you God bless you God bless you for coming over here Come on, somebody give them, give them some love while they walk. Come on, anybody else, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be a part of the kingdom. Come on, baby, there's room. Come on, baby, there's room. That's right. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, come on, come on, brothers. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Anybody else, I want to come into the kingdom of God. Stretch your hands toward the altar right now. Please pray for them like you wish somebody would have prayed for you the day you gave your life to Christ. Come on. Thank you, Father, for taking us into your kingdom and making all things new today. Making all things new today. Writing our name down in the Lamb Book of Life. Thank you for taking our sins away and for saving us and for rescuing us and making us new. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Come on, family, there's still time, there's still room. Come on, sir, bringing his babies up here. I wish somebody would help me praise God. The family's growing this morning. The family's growing this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you, sir. God bless you, mama. Come on, somebody give God high praise. 
Thank you, Lord. If you received this message today and God spoke to your life and you know God's about to update you and take you to the next level personally, throw up both hands right now all over this room. Come on. Father, from the right to the left, from the front to the back, I thank you for the grace to update and become an even greater version of everything you're calling us to be, not by our own strength or our own might or our own willpower, but we receive an impartation of grace that transforms and makes all things new. And I pray right now by the power of your precious Holy Spirit that today, Holy Spirit, you would deposit in your people new strategies. I heard him say it in prayer to me early this morning. He said, I'm gonna birth strategies for the people of God to bring hope to the hopeless and life to those who are dead. If you receive that, just lift those hands high one more time. Father, release that grace on your people in this place. I pray right now in Jesus' name that the Holy Ghost would just begin to take this house deeper in its purpose. Lord, give us divine strategies and solutions for the demonic assignment that has been released against our generation. Show us how to short circuit every plan of the devil. Give us a message that counteracts the lies of the enemy. Give us an anointing that breaks every yoke and a light bright enough to pierce every bit of darkness. We thank you right now that as they leave today, God, they do not leave their Christianity on the seat in which they sat, but they take this Holy Ghost with them out of this room. And at the restaurant, at the gas station, wherever they're going from here, home, hospital, wherever they're going, I pray that you will go before them. And when they get there, let them be light that can be seen, salt that can be tasted, make a difference in this dark world. Now, Father, I pray you keep them safe as they leave today. And I thank you for bringing us back tonight. And I pray you will release fresh oil on your people in the name of Jesus. And everybody who loves him said amen and amen. I believe this message today is speaking life and hope to you in your journey. We wouldn't be bringing it to you today had it not been for faithful partners around this nation who are helping us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you wanna leave us a prayer request, I want you to go to kevinwallace.tv. Let us know how our team can pray for you. You'll also find a place there where you can learn more about partnership, how you and your family can help us continue to spread this good news of Jesus around this nation and around this world. I look forward to hearing from you, and until next week, God bless you. We're praying over you and your family today.